Okay, good evening everybody. Um, I wish, you, wish to welcome you this evening on behalf of uh, Institute for Political Ecology and Multimedia Institute. As you probably know, we have a double bill tonight. We have two talks. First talk is by Ben Peters. Uh, the second talk is by Giacomo Dalisa. Giacomo Dalisa will be uh, talking about degrowth and the role of uh, the state in, de in the degrowth uh, narrative. So uh, if you have time, please stay around for the second talk as well. Um, our first talk tonight, let's sort this out. It doesn't seem so good. Sorry, let me try to sort this out. Okay. If it would help, we can download it as a PDF. I'm just... Okay. So ah, perfect. perfect. Great. Okay. Um, so the first talk tonight uh, is follow up to uh, Ben's uh, book, How Not to Network a Nation, which is a work in history of science looking at the, and history of technology looking at the efforts uh, within Soviet Union to develop uh, a national computer network. And it follows uh, in the footsteps of the work of uh, primarily people like, oh, it's disappearing again, <laughs> let me. Uh, of people like Slava Gerovich, who has written uh, a seminal study uh, in the history of Soviet, uh, Soviet cybernetics uh, from Newspeak to Cyberspeak. Uh, and uh, this effort has attempted to uh, map the path of development of Soviet science looking beyond um, the assumption of East-West Cold War divide. Um, okay. So I'll just quickly reboot so okay. that we don't have problems. Um, so, the works such as these have tried to uh, delineate a different uh, historical path of development of Soviet, Soviet science to that which was uh, commonly uh, taken as uh, being uh, official or being critical narrative, rather looking at uh, the intersection that have existed and in exchanges that have existed between um, Soviet scientists and uh, Western scientists. This is not only specific to the study of cybernetics. Similar work uh, has been done, for instance, in uh, economics. Um, for instance, Jana Borman has written a book, uh, Socialism in the Name of Markets, where she has tried to give an account how uh, socialist economics and uh, Western uh, neoclassical economics have worked hand in hand in developing tools of economics as uh, a scientific endeavor and that the two cannot be fully separated so much so that from the point of view of uh, e economists in uh, socialist countries while they were instilling uh, the economic system with market mechanisms they were still thinking that they were developing socialist uh, economics um, and vice versa there was a huge influence of people like Simon Kuznets and Raya Duyanevska on the development of Western economics so the the canonical story of the divide of East and West doesn't really work uh, the way it's understood um, okay let me just finish this So uh, Ben's work follows in, in the footsteps of the efforts of these uh, uh, scientists. Uh, and Ben has spent a fair amount of time uh, in uh, Russia and Ukraine as well, uh, studying 
the development of Soviet cybernetics and efforts to uh, to develop a national computer network, uh, extending the work uh, already uh, having been done by people like uh, Salagerovich. So um, I'll say a bit more about Ben specifically from his biography for those who haven't uh, read it prior. Um, so uh, Ben is a media scholar. He's the author of uh, this book, How Not to Network a Nation, The Uneasy History of the Soviet Internet. He's also the winner of the 2017 Vucinich Prize, as well as the auditor, editor of Digital Keywords, a Vocabulary of Information Society and Culture, published by Princeton. He's Associate Professor of Media Studies and Director of the Russian Studies and Digital Studies program, programs at the University of Tulsa. Uh, please help me wel welcome Ben and Ben. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Tom, for the generous introduction. It is a real treat to be here. And um, if I may, I just thank you all for coming in the cold, in the dark, um, and uh, coming to, to hear me talk through what I hope proves an entertaining, dramatic distillation of the book, which I'll pass around uh, if you want to check it out. Um, so uh, it's a real treat for me to be here. This is my first time in Zagreb, and I, I look forward to conversations um, immediately following this presentation and then hopefully long into the future. So let me uh, tell you a, a little bit about the book. Um, uh, we can, here's, here it is, it's coming around to see in a second. We'll just start right uh, with this, start, start directly with the story. So on the 1st of October, 19, uh, 1970, it was the morning, uh, the computer scientist Viktor Glushkov walked into the Kremlin to meet with the Politburo. He was an alert man with piercing eyes, rimmed in black glasses, with the kind of mind that, given one problem, would set about trying to devise a method for solving all um, similar problems. And at the moment, the Soviet Union had a serious problem. A year earlier, it seemed the United States had launched the ARPANET, the first packet switch distributed computer network that would in time seed the internet as we know it. Uh, this distributed network uh, was originally intended to nudge the US ahead of the Soviets, allowing, and you can see here, the survivable communication being highlighted. It would orig orig originally allow US scientists and government computers um, to communicate even in the event of a nuclear attack. And so, then it was the height of the Cold War tech race, and it seemed that the Soviets needed to respond. Glushkov's idea was to inaugurate what a few called an era of electronic socialism. He named his colossally ambitious project the All-State Automated System, which sought to streamline and technologically upgrade the entire planned economy. This uh, system would still make economic decisions by state plans, not market prices, but it would be sped up by computer modeling to predict equilibria before they happened. Glushkov, in short, wanted a smarter, faster decision making, and maybe even uh, electronic currency. All he needed was the Politburo's purse. But when Glushkov walked into the cavernous room that morning, he noticed two empty chairs at the long table. His two strongest allies, it seemed, were missing that day. Instead, he faced down a table of uh, ambitious, steely-eyed ministers, many of whom wanted the Politburo's purse for themselves. So to back out for a moment, between 1959 and 1989, leading men and women of Soviet uh, science and state repeatedly ventured to construct a national computer network for broadly pro-social purposes. With the deep wounds of the Second World War far from healed, the Soviet Union continued to specialize in massive modernization projects that had transformed a dispersed Tsarist nation of effectively illiterate peasants into a global nuclear power in the course of a couple of generations generations. And this is one of those modernization projects. After the Soviet Union leader uh, Nikita Khrushchev uh, denounced Stalin's personality cult in 1956, a sense of possibility, it seems, swept the nation and its intellectual milieu. Into the scene entered a host of socialist projects set to wire the national economy with computer networks, among them the first proposal anywhere in the world to create a national computer network for civilians. <coughs> 
Uh, the idea initially was the brainchild of the military researcher Anatoly Ivanovich Kitov. A young man with a small build and a keen mind for mathematics, Kitov had risen through the Red Army in the Second World War. <laughs> Then in 1952, he encountered Norbert Wiener's masterwork, Cybernetics, in a secret military library, the book's title, A Neologism, coined for the Greek for steersman, and a post-war science of self-governing information systems. With the support of senior scientists, Kitov then translated cybernetics into a robust Russian language approach to developing self-governing control and communication systems with computers. And the supple systems vocabulary of cybernetics was intended to equip the Soviet state with a high-tech toolkit for rational Marxist governance, an antidote to the very violence and cult of personality characterizing the strongman state previous. Indeed, perhaps cybernetics could even help ensure that there never would be another strongman state, or so went the technocratic dream. In 1959, as the director of a secret military computer research center, Kitov turned his attention to devoting what he called, quote, unlimited, unlimited quantities of reliable calculating processing power, thus to better plan uh, the national economy, which was at the time probably the most persistent economic information coordination problem besetting the Soviet project. For example, it was discovered in 1962 that a handmade calculation error had goofed the population predictions by about 4 million uh, people a few years later. So Kitov thought, as he wrote down in what he called the Red Book Proposal, um, a proposal uh, that he then sent to Khrushchev. In this proposal, he allowed, quote, civilian organizations to use the already functioning military computer complexes or computer complexes for economic planning in the nighttime hours when most, he assumed, generals would be sleeping. Here he thought economic planners could harness the military's computational surplus to adjust for census problems in real time, tweaking the economic plan nightly if needed. And he named this military civilian national network the Economic Automated Management System. As it happened, Kitov's military supervisors, in fact, intercepted the letter, the Red Book letter, before it reached Khrushchev. This is unlike previous ones, which had successfully reached him. I have more about the post, the sort of pernicious accidentalism of the Soviet post in the book. They were, uh, in fact, incensed uh, by his proposal that the Red Army share uh, uh, resources with civilian economic planners, resources that Kitov had in fact dared to call um, and describe as falling behind the times. Uh, in subsequently, a, military, a secret military tribunal was arranged to review his transgressions, uh, for which Kitov was promptly stripped of Communist Party membership for a year and dismissed from military uh, um, permanently. So ended the first national computer network uh, ever proposed. The idea, however, survived. In the early 1960s, another scientist took up Kitov's proposal, a man whom, in fact, Kitov would grow close enough to that decades later their children would marry. And that was, again, Viktor Mikhailovich Glushkov. The full title of Glushkov's plan, the All-State Automated System for the Gathering and Processing of Information for the Accounting, Planning, and Governance of the National Economy, USSR, I think speaks for itself and for its epic ambitions. Uh, first proposed in 1962, the All-State Automated System, or Obshoi Gasnarsvnaya Automatizirovna Systema Upravlenia, or OGAS for short, was intended to become a real-time remote access national computer network built on pre-existing and as well as new telephony wires. Um, in its most ambitious version, it would span most of the Eurasian uh, steppe. Uh, mapping itself like a nervous system onto every factory and enterprise in the Soviet planned economy. Its network was modeled uh, hierarchically after the th three tiered or a pyramid scheme uh, uh, or structure of the state and a formal state and economy at the time. There would be one central computer center in Moscow, uh, which would in turn connect uh, to. Uh, here, let me pull up this. Do I have. Yes. There. there it is. Okay. 
here, uh, there'd be one computer, central computer center in Moscow, which you can see here, that would in turn connect to as many 200 mid-level um, uh, computer centers in prominent cities. There's about 15 or 20 mapped on this, but just for a sense of context. And then that second level would in turn connect to as many as 20,000 computer terminals distributed throughout key production sites, factories, enterprises, et cetera, throughout the national economy. This is in fact consonant with Glushkov's greater life work commitments. He deliberately designed the network uh, to reflect what he saw as a deliberately decentralized uh, design. This meant that when, while Moscow could specify uh, uh, who received which authorizations to contact whom, that once they had been authorized, any, co any user could contact any other user um, on, in the pyramid network without direct permission subsequently. And so Glushkov, I think, personally understood the advantages of decentralized design and leveraging local knowledge in the construction of networks, uh, having spent so much of his time actually working on related um, algebraic problems in al algebra theory, while also personally ferrying between his home in Kiev uh, and the central capital. He, in fact, jokingly called the Kiev-Moscow train his second home. He spent so much time on it. The Orgas project appeared to many state officials and economic planners, uh, especially in the late 60s, to be probably the best next response to an old conundrum. The Soviets, of course, were long agreed that communism was the f way of the future, but very few since Marx and Engels have been quite sure how to go about enacting it. For Glushkov, it seemed that networked computing might just be uh, a response and a way to inch the country toward an age of what uh, Francis Spufford has since called in a delightful novel, if you don't know it, The Age of Red Plenty. It's a, just a, a, a treat of a book. Namely, the computing uh, or networked computing might be the means by which the sluggish pulp-based lifeblood of the command economy, that means quotas, plans, and wrist-bending compendiums of industry standards, could be transformed into the nation's neuronal firings, moving at the sublime speed of electricity. The project signified no less than, again, the ushering in of electronic socialism. Such ambitious projects required uh, uh, committed people, brilliant uh, people, willing to throw off old ways of thinking. And Glushkov found some of them uh, here at the Institute of Cybernetics in the uh, southern outskirts of Kiev, uh, where he ran the Institute of Cybernetics for about 20 years, beginning in 1962. Uh, he filled the, insti um, the institute with ambitious young men and women. The average age of the researchers was about 25. Uh, and he and his youthful ta um, staff dedicated themselves to a number of cybernetic projects, OGOS, the network being central to them all, uh, that were all in some ways in the service of the Soviet state, but also sought something else. Um, for example, a system of electronic receipts that would virtualize hard currency into an online ledger of accounts, and this being proposed in the early 1960s. Glushkov, who was known to talk down Communist Party ideologues by quoting, and this seems like a very healthy strategy, by quoting paragraphs of Marx from memory, he described his innovations as, in fact, a faithful fulfillment, of course, of Marx's prophecy of a moneyless socialist future. Unfortunately for Glushkov, the idea of uh, Soviet e-currency stirred up unhelpful anxieties and did not receive committee approval in 1962. Fortunately, however, his grand economic ambitions did live on to see another day. So the cyberneticists in, the, in Kiev imagined a kind of smart neural network, a nervous system for the Soviet economy. This choice cybernetic analogy between computer network and brain bore its imprint on other computing theory innovations that they developed. Uh, for example, instead of the so-called von Neumann bottleneck, um, which limits the amount of transferable data uh, in the architecture of a, a processor, uh, most computer processors, Glushkov's team instead proposed what they called um, macro piping processing, which was modeled after the simultaneous firings of the brain's many synapses. In addition to countless other mainframe computer, computer projects, um, other theoretical schemes included uh, automata theory, uh, the paperless office, and even natural language programming, uh, which would let humans communicate uh, with computers semantically, not just syntactically, as most computer programming does today. So the idea here would be that a computer would be able to recognize that the statement, the, uh, the chair sits on the ceiling, is nonsense. Not because it's syntactically nonsensical, but it's because its meaning is nonsensical. 
Uh, that's the idea behind this one. And most ambitiously, Glushkov and his students theorized what they called information immortality. Uh, something we might call mind uploading with uh, Asimov or Arthur C. Clarke in hand. Uh, for a sense of what he meant, uh, uh, on his deathbed, uh, decades later, Glushkov comforted his grieving wife with the resonant reflection, and I love the kind of natural materialist philosophy here. Be at ease, he soothed her. One day the light from our earth will pass by constellations, and on each constellation we will appear young again. Thus we will be together forever in the eternities. That, but information immortality, would be directly upload not only individual but collective consciousness into the dynamic computer memory networks. Uh, so that's what they meant. But even more than just theoretical ambitions, these cyberneticists also had a, lived a, a daily life. And after their work day, they indulged in a comedy club full of frivolity and merry pranksterism uh, that bordered on the outright defiant at times. At once no more than a place to vent off steam, their after-hours work club also saw itself as a virtual country, independent of Moscow's rule. They christened their group Kibertonia, or Cybertonia, at a New Year's party uh, in 1960, and organized regular social events, uh, such as holiday dances, symposia and conferences in Kiev and Lviv, and sometimes publishing tongue-in-cheek papers such as on wanting to remain invisible, at least to the authorities. Uh, instead of event invitations, the group issued fun-filled faux passports or uh, wedding certificates uh, or newsletters. We can come back to these. They're full of puns. Um, punch card currency uh, and even a Cybertonia constitution. In parody of the Soviet Council, Soviet right, Council governance structure, Cybertonia was governed by a council of robots, and at the head of that council sat their mascot and supreme leader, a saxophone playing robot, which appears to be a kind of nod to the U.S. cultural import of jazz. Glushkov too partook a, a bit in this um, uh, internal resistance, calling his memoirs, quote, despite the authorities. This, of course, despite the fact that he himself his, was the vice president of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. I think as uh, Fred Turner has shown, counterculture, or the power to both uh, count and counter other powers, has always been kin to cyberculture. Uh, this, this story that I'm telling also taking place in the 1960s. All of this ambition, of course, required money, and lots of money, uh, especially for Glushkov's Orgas project. So again, this meant coming back to convince the Politburo to give it to them. And so it was that Glushkov found himself where we began, in the Kremlin on the 1st of October, 1970, hoping to continue the work of Cybertonia and to bring a Soviet internet to the bedraggled uh, state. It seemed at least one man stood in Glushkov's way. Uh, Here's a picture of that Politburo meeting and some of the major actors. And the, the, the Minister of Finance, Vasily Garbuzov. Garbuzov, it seemed, did not want any shiny real-time optimized computer networks governing or informing the Soviet economy. He instead called for simple computers that would flash lights or play music uh, to uh, stimulate egg production, such as he had seen in a hen house during a recent visit to Minsk. His motivations, it seemed, were not born out of only a kind of common sense pragmatism, however. He actually wanted the funding for his own ministry. In fact, rumor holds that he had approached the economic uh, mind, reform minded uh, Prime Minister Ale Alexei Kasigin in private before the 1st of October uh, meeting, threatening that in private that if his competitor ministry, the Central Statistical Administration run by Pyotr Starovsky there, um, had in fact retained control over the Ogas proposal and project and its subsequent billions of rubles, then Garbuzov and his Ministry of Finance would internally submarine the, any reform efforts that it might bring about. Just as the ministry, as his ministry had done to Kasigin's piecemeal liberalization reform efforts five years earlier. So Glushkov needed allies to face down Garbuzov and to keep the Soviet uh, proposal, internet proposal alive, but there were none at the meeting. The two seats left empty that day were in fact the prime ministers and the technocratic general secretary Leonid uh, Brezhnev's 
in all, these two uh, missing men were probably the two most powerful men uh, in the Soviet state, and also, at the moment, unlikely allies in support of the Ogas. But it seemed that they chose to be absent rather than to face down a mutiny of ministries. Thus, Garbusov successfully convinced the Politburo that the Ogas project, with its ambitious plans to optimally model and manage information flows in the plant and economy, was simply too much too soon. The committee, after nearly going the other way, felt it was safer to support Garbusov, and the still top secret Ogas project was left to languish in review limbo for another decade. I argue that the forces that brought down the Ogas are uh, resemble, they're a microcosm uh, of those that eventually undid the Soviet Union. That is, the surprisingly informal uh, forms of institutional misbehavior are of note here. Opponents were many, uh, subversive ministers, status quo inclined bureaucrats, nervous factory managers, confused workers, <coughs> and even other economic reform, uh, reformers uh, uh, who opposed the OGAS project because it was simply in their s institutional self-interest to do so. Thus, without state funding and oversight, the National Network Project uh, for ushering in electronic socialism splintered in the 1970s and 1980s into a patchwork of dozens and then hundreds of isolated, non-interoperable uh, factory local area control systems. Imagine like a local area network for, a, for a, a factory only. Thus, the Soviet state failed to network their nation, not because it was too rigid or too top-down in design, but rather because it was in part too fickle or too pernicious in practice. I think there's an irony in this. The first global computer networks took root in the US anyways, thanks to well-regulated state funding and to collaborative research environments, while the contemporary and notably independent national network efforts in the USSR floundered due to unregulated competition and institutional infighting among Soviet administrators. Thus, the first global computer networks emerged thanks to capitalists behaving like cooperative socialists, not socialists behaving like competitive capitalists. In the fate of the Soviet internet story that I'm telling today, I think we can glimpse a clear and present warning to the future of the internet. Today, the internet, um, which the word, sometimes uh, still thought of as a single global network of networks for advancing variously institutional liberty or commerce or, or democracy, is in serious decline, if not all out crisis. Consider how often companies and states seek to silo their online experience. The ubiquitous app, Open Up Your Smartphone, uh, is more of a walled garden for rent seekers than it is a public commons for the browsing, for, or for browsers. Inward looking gravity wells, such as Facebook or the Chinese firewall, also increasingly gobble up sites today uh, that link outwards. So too are the heads of many nations, quite understandably, Russia, India, Ru uh, France, and others, quite eager to internationalize the ICANN or the Internet Corporation for assigned names and numbers, and thus to enforce reg local regulations for their citizens. In fact, if we look more broadly, there are hundreds of non-Internet networks that have been functioning across countries and corporations for decades. The future of computing networks undoubtedly holds not one Internet, but many distinct online ecosystems. In other words, the future undoubtedly resembles the past. The, 19, uh, the 20th century features multiple national computer networks clamoring for global status. The Cold War drama of what we might dub with a wink again, like the Soviet networking, or in the delightful title of Slava Gorovich, the Soviet internet, helps to fill out, I think, the comparative study of computer networks with a sort of internet negative 1.0 case study. Weighed in the balance of many pasts and likely future networks, the perception that there is only one single global network of networks is, of course, the exception to the rule. Given that the Cold War irony at the heart of this story, namely that cooperative capitalists outmaneuvered competitive socialists, that this did not play out well for the Soviets of yesteryear, perhaps we should not be too sure that the internet of tomorrow will fare much better. Move to a broader point. The anthropologist and philosopher Bruno Latour once quipped that technology is society made durable, by which he meant something like that social values are embedded in technologies, 
consider, for example, Google's PageRank algorithm, the heart of its search function, which is often deemed so-called democratic, because among other factors, it count links, or rather links to sites making links as votes. And like politicians with votes, the pages with the most links uh, ranks the highest. In this model, it would appear that the internet is some kind of vehicle of liberty or of democracy or of commerce. But I think this is in large part because the internet has cemented itself in the popular imagination, at least in the West, just as Western values appeared to triumph in the wake of the, this Cold War in the 1990s. The Soviet internet story is an antidote to that uh, situation, and it in fact reverses Latour's aphorism. So too is society technology made temporary. In other words, of course, as our social values shift, so too will what appears obvious about technology. The Soviets once embedded values into their networks, cybernetic collectivism, statist hierarchy, planned economies that should probably seem foreign to many today. So too then will the values that we modern viewers and observers and users attach to our networks strike future observers as strange. Network technologies will doubtlessly endure and evolve, even as our fondest assumptions about them pass into the dustbin of history. Glushkov's story is also a stirring reminder, I think, to the investor classes and other agents of would-be technological change that astonishing genius, far-seen foresight, and political <coughs> human are not enough to change the world. Supporting institutions make all the difference. And that perhaps is the express lesson of the story told here. That our media environment is continuously mined for uh, digital data or other forms of privacy exploitation. That the institutional networks that undergrade our modern media environment are themselves makings of computer networks and cultures who, that, whose institutional backstories are far from singular and simultaneously always vital. So while computer networked pro uh, projects and the promoters will continue to pedestal brighter networked futures publicly, I suspect that private institutional forces will, unless checked, continue to capitalize on surveillance networks committed to making themselves privy to our lives. And perhaps that is what privacy is all about. Uh, not the personal uh, like protective rights for my individual space, but rather the sweeping power of information omnivorous institutions to pry into our lives, to make that privation their own. I think the Soviet case study in this case reminds us that the US National Security Agency's domestic spying program, Microsoft's cloud, or a host of others actually participate in a much longer 20th century tradition of general secretariats committed to privatizing personal and public information for their own self-interested institutional gain. In other words, again, we should not take too much comfort from the fact that the global internet first evolved from cooperative capitalists, not competitive socialists. The story of the Soviet internet is a reminder that we internet users enjoy no guarantees that the private interests propping up the internet today will behave any better than those greater forces that, whose unwillingness to cooperate not only spelled the end of the Soviet electronic socialism, but perhaps threatens to end the current chapter in our own network age. Voila. Thank you.